Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another virtual investor event hosted by NZX. My name is Doug Vrain, and I'm with the Capital Markets Origination Team here at the uh, New Zealand Exchange. Before we get into it, just a, a real quick reminder of the format. Uh, we have three companies presenting. Each one will have 15 minutes to go through their presentation, and then we'll do five minutes of Q&A. Uh, and the way we uh, uh, ask questions, and definitely encourage you to do that, is through the chat function on your um, on your Zoom screen. The questions will come in and we'll try and get through as many as we can with each presenter. Uh, whatever we can't get to, we'll, we'll get the answers and mail them out afterwards. And um, also just a reminder that the video will be recorded and sent out on YouTube, so uh, you can watch it later if you'd like as well. So today, uh, as I said, we have um, three companies presenting. We've got uh, Goodman Property Trust, Radius Care, which are both listed on the NZX, and then Ministry of Awesome, which is an organization that helps uh, startups. So we're going to jump right in with um, Goodman Property Trust, and I'm going to introduce the CFO, Andy Eakin, um, and the new CEO, James Spence, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, Andy's the CEO or CFO of Goodman Property Trust. His role involves managing the finance and associated activities of Goodman Property Trust and Goodman's New Zealand operations. Uh, Andy has over 25 years experience in finance roles and has worked in Ireland, Scotland, and New Zealand. And quick introduction to James, who's sitting along with him. Uh, James, James is currently the Director of Investment Management for Goodman Property Trust, but as I said, uh, was recently uh, appointed as CEO, going uh, effective in January 2023. So congratulations, James. Um, James has been with Goodman for um, a while, since 2006, and has held various roles uh, within the New Zealand business uh, and across Europe. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and we'll be back with Q&A um, from there. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, and good afternoon, everyone. So look, uh, James and I will uh, run through what's essentially a slightly shortened version of our annual results presentation. Uh, Goodman Property Trust annual results for the year to 31 March uh, 22, which were released a few weeks ago. Um, so first of all, just to make a few comments on what we're seeing, uh, it, you know, the, the general environment that we're operating in. And uh, very much uh, we've got a, an increasing digitization of the economy, uh, which is driving consumer expectations, uh, in particular around e-commerce. Uh, this in itself has become quite a significant driver for us in our business, with our customers uh, looking for locations which are closer to the end consumers, making it easier for them to deliver to them. Uh, they're also trying to get higher utilization uh, out of the space that they lease from us. GMT's infill locations, which it's invested in uh, over a number of years, but in particular more recently, uh, and a good example of that's at Roma Road. Uh, have been instrumental really in driving the record levels of development that we've got underway within the trust. Um, equity markets uh, can have quite short-term views, but real estate is very much a long-term game and we're very focused on the long-term total returns for investors in GMT. Uh, allied with that, uh, important for us to have a sustainable capital structure and a very strong and resilient balance sheet. So if I turn on and just make some comments around sustainability. Um, last year we made some fairly big commitments around developments, uh, and this year there are some new commitments that we've uh, talked about uh, around the existing portfolio. Uh, in addition to that, um, we are a TOI2 certified carbon zero organization, and for FY22 that certification has been achieved again, uh, with 50% lower carbon emissions than we had in our FY20 year. In terms of those new targets for the portfolio, we've committed that by 2025, our core portfolio, so those are our best assets with a very long-term life, um, uh, we're targeting 100% of that to have upgraded to LED lighting, uh, and also to remove the most climate damaging R22 refrigerants uh, with much lower emission equivalent alternatives. Uh, and we're targeting neighbors ratings, so this is an energy performance rating for eligible office buildings at our hybrid business park. In terms of the development commitments that we made last year, uh, we committed that all of our new developments would target five Green Star built ratings. Uh, and that five Green Star rating represents New Zealand excellence uh, in terms of the, the Green Star rating scale. 
Um, we're very much repurposing brownfield sites. So as I said before, those are close to consumers and also key transport infrastructure. So that reduces transport congestion and emissions uh, as our customers deliver to end consumers. We turn on to the financial results uh, and just look at some of the highlights uh, for the year that we just reported. So profit before tax, $763.8 million. That was a record result and included within that was a $660 million revaluation gain for the full year. With operating earnings of $118.3 million. So that was up 3% on FY21, uh, despite the impact of COVID through the year. Net tangible asset backing, so the, the value of the real assets that sit uh, behind each unit within the trust, uh, $2.60 per unit. Total return for the year, 25%. So this is looking at the growth in the capital value, so the $660 million revaluation contributing into this, uh, but also the distributions paid to our unit holders. And those distributions were at 5.5 cents per unit for the year, with cash earnings of 6.66 cents per unit. A very strong driver behind that great result was the like-for-like -like rental growth that we've seen in the portfolio, and that sat at just over 5%. And James will touch on that a little more shortly. So this slide looks at cash earnings, which is our preferred measure, performance measure for the, for the unit trust. Uh, as I mentioned, 6.6 .6 cents uh, per, year, per unit uh, for the year. Uh, that was up over 6% on the previous year of 6.28 cents. Our distribution policy uh, says that we'll distribute between 80 and 90% of cash earnings each year, and the 5.5 cents per unit distribution represented 82.6% of those cash earnings. The benefit of this policy and the retention of some of the earnings means that all of the capex that we spend on our stabilized portfolio, that's our income producing portfolio, uh, is covered out of the earnings uh, that the trust generates from that portfolio, which means we're not debt funding capex uh, that, that we spend on it. Uh, $19.4 million of capex in the year fully covered. For the year that we've now moved into, we're expecting our cash earnings to be up by around 4% to about 6.9 cents per unit. And our distributions, uh, setting them at the midpoint um, of, the, of the target range, so at 85% of cash earnings, distributions expected to be 5.9 cents per unit, which is 7% up in the year that we've just completed. I mentioned before that uh, strong, resilient balance sheet is important, and uh, our focus on that uh, remains really consistent. Uh, LVR, or our gearing ratio, is one of the key measures and key indicators of the strength of the balance sheet. On the chart, you can see uh, we started the financial year at 19.2% LVR, and we reported at 31 March just past 21.3%. The board has a preferred range of between 20 and 30% uh, for that LVR, so that's sitting towards the bottom of it. But when we roll forward with the record level of developments that we've committed to, uh, plus an acquisition that settled uh, just after balance date, uh, committed LVR sits at around 26%, so still very comfortably within that preferred range. That ensures that we've got capacity for acquisitions, further investment in our development pipeline, and also, as I've mentioned, resilience in the event that there might be a decline in asset values. This next slide looks uh, at the makeup of our debt funding. Um, so maintaining a very diverse debt portfolio is important for us, uh, and also very strong levels of liquidity uh, within the business. During the course of the last financial year, uh, we issued $200 million of six-year wholesale bonds. Uh, so in total now, we've got $400 million of our debt uh, provided through the wholesale bond market. We've extended our bank facilities from $400 million to $670 million. And just after our balance date, uh, we did our first ever uh, green retail bond issuance, a five-year issue uh, for $150 million. As a result of that issue, uh, today we've got around $600 million of, of available liquidity, uh, which allows us to fund the development pipeline. In addition, just worth pointing out, just in this rising interest rate environment, that as of today, we've got about 75% of our debt fixed uh, so that the interest rate doesn't change over the next 12 months. I'll pass you over to James. 
Thanks, Andy. And hi, everybody. Uh, so we'll jump over this slide here. Uh, it's, it's good to have uh, this opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, so thanks very much. I might just touch here on uh, what we've been up to in the last uh, 12, mo 12 months on the acquisition front. Um, we've been successful in buying uh, five sites across the city, uh, which equate to about 50 um, hectares of investments and in last mile industrial uh, sites across the city. Um, and one here is an example, the acquisition of the, uh, the old Sleepyhead site in Otahu, which we purchased um, just at the end of the year. Uh, under a sale and leaseback scenario uh, with Sleepyhead. We bought the site, uh, they'll stay there for uh, about three years and at the end of that lease, uh, we will uh, redevelop the site. These acquisitions will form a significant part of our uh, redevelopment pipeline. Uh, we've got many options across the city uh, for redevelopment for our existing customers. And that means our portfolio now, as you can see on this slide, is about 1.1 million square meters of logistics space across the city. You know, Auckland, as I'm sure uh, many of you will know, is a, is a market with high barriers to entry for both uh, investors like us and our occupiers or our customers, distribution companies. And our portfolio that has been built up uh, over the last 18 years uh, provides for many different options uh, for logistics companies looking to expand or change their networks. The portfolio at the moment uh, is pretty much at capacity. You can see there 99.4% uh, occupied, and we've got a weighted average lease term of, of just over uh, six years. The last 12 months has been pretty busy on the, on the leasing front. Uh, out of that 1.1 million square metres of uh, warehouse space, uh, about a quarter of it, so 270,000 square metres of warehouse space was renegotiated or put on uh, new terms by way of variation or new lease or renewal. And that's about sort of, yeah, as I mentioned, 25% of the portfolio. And those, um, those leases that were renegotiated saw passing rental growth uh, for those customers of uh, just over 11%. And that was coupled with you know, pretty low incentives. So incentives of around 2.5%. Uh, uh, leasing inquiry uh, post the end of the year, post uh, March 31, a couple of months back, uh, does remain strong. Uh, and what you've seen in the Auckland market is, in the industrial market, is you know vacancy since you know the last 10 years has sort of come down from 10, 9, 8, 7 percent, right down in the wider market to below uh, 1 percent. So there's not a lot of options for customers to move around. Um, it's extremely limited, and that's going to uh, to rental growth. Uh, and uh, warehouses across Auckland are becoming uh, very expensive uh, to lease. <clears throat> in terms of our, our customer base, we continue to do a higher proportion of uh, development uh, business or development deals with, with our largest customers. So you can see their uh, NZ Post and Main Freight you know, becoming bigger parts of our portfolio as we do big developments for them as they rework their distribution network. On the left there, you can see our customer makeup, what, are, what the businesses within our portfolio actually do. And around 75% of our customers are focused on some form of warehousing uh, or distribution. When it comes to rent relief, obviously it's been a you know, pretty interesting and difficult time for a lot of customers, uh, especially those customers that have been focused on the likes of uh, hospitality, retail, uh, accommodation. And that's where we're focused at our rent relief. Out of our 226 customers, about 35 of them sort of fall in that more retail area. You know, that's a, a large number of customers, but only represents, because they're smaller, about 2% of the, our income. And when it comes to requests for rent relief, which we did have a lot of over the last couple of years during the lockdowns, we really focus our rent relief on those businesses, you know, the businesses that did not have the opportunity uh, to make back uh, lost income and are generally more vulnerable. So jump over to our development program. So over the last sort of 10, 15 years, we've had a development program which has largely been the build out of Highbrook. Uh, and uh, our development program's probably sat around 100 to $150 million uh, in value uh, each year. And the sort of dynamics that Andy mentioned before about logistics demand, you know, online uh, sort of booming all around the world has, has come right through to our development program. 
and that number has significantly increased. You know, the likes of NZ Post and Main Freight, as I mentioned before, you know, taking a lot more space, a lot more um, sophisticated requirements coming through, and that means our development program at the moment is over 400 million or 100,000 square meters of space across seven projects. These are great um, facilities that are that are that will be sitting in the trust uh, once uh, they are complete or they are already within the trust through the development. And they generally involve the dem demolition of older brownfield buildings that I mentioned before, you know, the likes of the sleepy heat asset that will one day be redeveloped. So those assets, you know, they produce a yield on cost for the trust of about 5% and they have a, a weighted average lease term of about 16 years as those businesses look to sort of really entrench themselves in the, in the top locations. Obviously much has been said about the construction environment. Uh, and we've got a big development program underway at the moment, so we're really cognizant uh, of the risks there. And we've got a, a you know really strong, experienced in-house development team that do what they can to you know, keep a lid on that and and control that for this business. So we've bolstered the in-house um, capabilities and you know hired more people within the development team. Uh, we've adapted our procurement to sometimes um, you know order goods that are scarce uh, well in advance. Um, we also leverage on our connections with the wider Goodman Group, you know, big developer all around the world. And we're also putting more uh, sort of time and um, allowance for, you know, construction cost uh, sort of elevation into our feasibilities and more allowance for profit and risk. So just, just come back to the sort of, you know, wrap it all together. This is the last slide. Clearly there's a bit of uncertainty at the moment with uh, things changing and with you know, rising interest rates. However, when it comes to logistics space, you know, we're a very long-term business. Um, we're building assets that we plan to keep long, long-term and we don't see the trend which Andy mentioned before of online spending slowing down uh, in the long-term. You know, we expect with a lot of customers within the Auckland distribution space uh, and last mile delivery space, the likes of NZ Post, with them reworking their networks, you'll be able to get your parcels uh, even faster. And we think that will kick along online spending even more, putting more pressure on the on the demand uh, for logistics space. So for GMT, you know what that means is a stronger development workbook. It also means strong rental growth. Uh, we had 5% uh, like for like rental growth coming through GMT in the last 12 months. And that all goes towards uh, strong underlying cash flows. And as, as John, um, sorry, as Andy mentioned before, you know, we're putting out uh, a guidance for a 4% increase in cash earnings for the next 12 months and a distribution increase of 7% uh, for the next for the next year. So that's it from us. And uh, if you've got any questions, we're happy to take them, Andy or myself. Uh, thanks, James, Andy. Appreciate you guys putting that together. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in around uh, acquisitions. Can you guys talk a little bit about when you um, are assessing acquisitions, what, what are the most important factors you're looking at, uh, number one, and then do you guys have a property portfolio uh, outside of Auckland and will you make acquisitions outside of Auckland? Yeah, okay, so yeah, we've been pretty busy on the acquisition front in the last uh, four or five years. You know. Our development program has largely been on the basis of greenfield redevelopments, you know, building the likes of Highbrook out. Uh, about four or five years ago, we, we exited the office market in Green Lane in the city here, and we invested a lot of those proceeds back into buying um, sort of really well located large industrial um, brownfield sites uh, that were on trend for sort of last mile delivery, you know, the likes of Roma Road and, and Mount Wayne and investments. And, um, and Penrose, et cetera. So really, you know, focused on uh, location. So, you know, making sure we have the locations that our customers are gonna want to have long-term. You know, we could go into the outskirts of Auckland and, and pick up, you know, some greenfield land, but what our customers are telling us is they wanna be in those last mile locations. And we've seen that overseas for Goodman. So location, absolutely number one. We want a bit of scale uh, and we want it to be re relatively regular. You know, we want, uh, a site which obviously stacks up in terms of its layout uh, for a you know nice clean uh, distribution facility. So every time we're buying one of these sites, we're you know even though we might not be redeveloping it for four or five years, 
we're, we're we're doing a bulk of location and making sure you know we've got we've got a plan as to what we're going to build. Um, as an example, uh, once those existing existing customers leave, then when it comes to investing outside uh, uh, Auckland, uh, you know, Goodman globally at around that same time made the decision to invest in gateway cities with population growth, where the consumer base is, where our customers want to be, and in locations where land is scarce. So within New Zealand, um, we really think that's Auckland. We used to have um, some investments in Christchurch. You know, Christchurch is a great place, um, but from an industrial investment point of view, there's, there's a truckload of land available, right? So it doesn't make your product scarce, and therefore you're not likely to get uh, long-term rental growth, which, is, which has been the case in Auckland, uh, and we've uh, seen come through our assets. So, if a customer asked us to do a to do something with them somewhere else in um, New Zealand, we'd look at that. Um, but for the moment, and for the medium term, I would imagine, uh, we'll be uh, solely focused on Auckland. Nice. Thank you. Uh, another question on, on um, development. Do you guys um, always uh, take the position as a sole developer? Or do you or do you sometimes share projects and costs with other developers and, and partner on on projects? No, GM, GMT um, does it solely by itself. Um, historically, uh, GMT has been involved with uh, office developments down here. We, we've done it with uh, joint venture partners and, and we've had joint ventures. Probably wouldn't rule that out in the future, you know, if the right asset, the right partner came along. But for the moment and for the last little while, it's all been uh, GMT doing it by itself. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you very much. We do have a couple more questions and we'll send those. Uh, you guys get answers and then get them out to the audience so we can um, get that information. But again, really appreciate you spending the time to chat with everyone and putting some uh, thoughts together. So uh, thank you very much. No worries. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thank you. So now we will um, move on to our second presenter. Um, we're, we will welcome uh, Andrew Peskett from Radius Care, and, and uh, Andrew can tell you a bit more about Radius Care, but just a little background on Andrew. He's the CEO of Radius Care, uh, bring, brings extensive experience in the retirement village and aged care industry, having previously been a senior executive at MetLife Care, which is a leading New Zealand retirement village operator uh, with total assets in excess of $4 billion. At MetLife Care, his roles included acting CEO, GM of Corporate Services, acting GM Operations, and General Counsel and Company Secretary. So, Andrew, thank you very much for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Doug, and hi all. Uh, as Doug said, um, my name is Andrew, and we're going to talk through. Uh, look, first of all, it's great to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you about the Radius story. Uh, we are going to, or I'm going to present a brief slide deck, which again is a summary um, of our year-end results that were announced last Monday, and then open the floor to questions. So on page one, we've got some amazing residents there. You can see um, at our Baker Village up north, and um, they, we, we are, you know, super proud of what we do for all of our residents through the country, and more of that um, in a minute. So slide two, most importantly, um, I always try to lead with the people and uh, our people are absolutely amazing in the four, month, four or so months I've been in the job, I've started to travel around our care homes and we have some amazing people, around 1,700 staff. They incredibly have a smile on their face all day. They give all day to our residents uh, in our rest homes and um, smaller retirement villages and I've got the utmost respect for everything they do. There are jobs that I couldn't do in many of our care homes, and I'm super appreciative of them. That's the, the, probably the most important thing. Uh, following on from that, we've appointed Wendy Jenkins, you can see on that slide, to start next month. And uh, I've been in the job since February, so uh, it's a bit of a, refre a refreshed new executive team that's uh, executing on the strategy that's previously been announced to the market, and I'll talk more to that in a minute, but just a, a great opportunity to say thank you again to our, our amazing people and um, try to connect with them as much as we can through the executive team. The next slide, just a bit of background, because 
you know, I know some of you may well know who we are, some may not. We've only been listed uh, just on a year and a half now. I think it's critical to pay um, great homage and respect to our founder, Brian Cree, my boss, uh, the executive chair who effectively founded um, Radius Care uh, and has built the company up to the 23 care homes that it currently is. And um, we, we have a focus largely on high acuity care. And so what does that mean? That means um, care at the higher end or higher need spectrum to our customers so that we're providing um, right through to end of life palliative care, um, care for all customers um, through the, the care spectrum and now starting to have another provision of, of um, retirement village services as well. Because of the, partly because of the high acuity care we give, the, um, our EBITDA per bed, I was told not to mention too many numbers, but I'll throw in a couple of numbers here. Our EBITDA per bed is one of the highest, if not the highest in the sector, which is great. That's $20,000 per bed. Um, and another couple of key numbers uh, that we announced last week were our um, FO and um, pre for 16 EBITDA that were up on year on year. I think it's just useful to note that. We've had a good year. Uh, despite the challenges and um, those key metrics were up and we will be paying a dividend later in the month. Uh, another key part of the execution of strategy is the acquiring our freehold land and we've acquired eight freehold properties in the last 12 months and a wonderful care home um, in Invercargill and care home and retirement village called Clare House at the bottom of the South Island in Invercargill. So next slide shows our properties from Haruru to, um, so from uh, up north to down south, um, right the breadth or, or the length of New Zealand. Um, as I said, from Northland down to Invercargill, uh, you can see some details around the, the mix of beds. I think the key thing here of this slide is that traditionally, as I said, we have been a high acuity care provider. Uh, as you can see, bottom left, we have 95% of our portfolio uh, care beds, but we are pivoting um, as part of our strategy to have more of a retirement village um, mix. Um, and, you know, so we are looking at various ways of doing that. And what does that mean in practical terms? We have greenfield sites that we're looking to acquire that are in the Northwoods, um, in Northwood in Christchurch is an example where it's just bare land and we build uh, a village or and or care home on that land. We also are undertaking brownfield activities, which means we are building out our existing facilities and um, adding extra care beds, suites and retirement village units on existing facilities, such as St. Jones in Hamilton, which is one of the properties we acquired in May. And then thirdly, uh, looking to continue to acquire um, value accretive opportunistic care homes and or um, retirement villages such as Clare House that we acquired at the end of last calendar year. Uh, so those are the three ways we're growing the business um, and that's actually really, really exciting to be part of that strategy and um, building the team to, to, to help um, move that strategy forward over the next four to five years. So, as we set out in our um, year-end results, we, we've now established the growth springboard. Uh, and what does that look like? We talked about ownership of properties. Historically, we had owned few of our properties and we'd leased many of our properties. We're pivoting towards owning more of our properties, which gives us more optionality to build and uh, reconfigure those properties and have them under our control and um, work with them to, to develop them more profitably. So that strategy is paying off. We have acquired, as I said, eight of the our portfolio in the last 12 months. So as set out on this slide, we currently own 12 and lease 11 of those properties, which is um, a good position to be in. And obviously, over time, we may well acquire more um, to get up to, to the, the total portfolio of 23. Development pipeline, really exciting here around the retirement village units and the care homes. Uh, we've got a small but um, growing development team. We've got some really, really good strategic partners that we use in terms of construction uh, partners and we work closely with them. 
And so far, particularly because our main uh, development is going to be in Christchurch, uh, we don't foresee too many headwinds um, and are managing that process quite well. And I'll move on to that in the slide in a minute. And as we touched on earlier, we've had a refresh of the executive team. Delighted to have Wendy join us next month and um, with a new team um, to execute the strategy and um, you know really really build on that growth springboard. And this is probably one of my favourite slides. Uh, I, I know that uh, development is something that's critical in terms of value to shareholders and um, growing the business um, pretty rapidly in line with our ambitions and our strategy. So. If you look at the top left, we were down, uh, if you look super closely, you might be able to see me at the back of that picture. We're down at um, Thornley Park on, in the outskirts of New Plymouth a couple of weeks ago to have a look through this development. It's going really well. It's on time and it's on budget. Uh, so there are two big ticks there. Uh, the units are currently configured, as you can see, to be care beds, but there is a difference and we're looking potentially to have some of those units uh, that could be converted to care suites, which means we would charge an occupation right agreement up front to customers if there's the demand for that, uh, to give us some optionality on the sell down of that project. And that development is, as I said, on time and on budget to be completed later this year in December. So I'm promised a um, Christmas party, opening party for that, and which I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, the other two, um, Taupaki and Lexham Park in planning phase and uh, more care beds uh, and care suites. And then bottom right, really worth dwelling on Northwood is a flagship project for us in Belfast in North Canterbury um, or just north of Christchurch. I'm due to head down there next week, which I'm super excited about. We will be building, as you can see, retirement villa, retirement village villas, apartments, care beds and care suites. So Northwood will be our first fully integrated retirement village and care home with um, customers able to move in in their 70s right through to um, you know the end of life palliative care and all the stages in between. It's really exciting. The development team's doing a great job uh, in designing that and we're hoping that Earthworks will take place next year as we've previously signaled to the NZX. And, um, Really excited about that and um, that all the development that we've got in the pipeline and, and looking to convert more opportunities as well. Um, not on the slide, but part of the UCG acquisition that we completed in May, we have another 100 units that we'll be developing. And as I said, Summit St. Jones and around the country, um, which will provide us again, um, another pathway to growth. And last couple of slides before we close out. Um, Again, ending with people, I think it's pretty, pretty critical. This chap here is uh, a guy I actually knew in a former life, Jimmy Sprague, down at Fulton Home. Um, has always been a happy chap, looks amazingly happy and um, great to see interacting with our staff and um, just brings a smile to my face to see uh, people like Jimmy and other residents enjoying themselves. And then next slide, again at Fulton in Dunedin. I'm not sure which birthday uh, this chap had, but uh, he looks like he's enjoying himself. And again, um, love the orange uniforms there and um, providing great care to our residents. And that's kind of a, a wonderful way to snapshot our business and um, what we represent because our staff, as I said right at the start, do an amazing job, uh, come to work through you know, some challenging times over the last year or two, but always do an amazing job in connecting with our residents and their families. And um, if I can maintain that and improve that care and um, professionalism and um, commitment for our um, exceptional people delivering the exceptional care, that will be a job well done. And um, I am super proud of them. So a good way to end the formal presentation. Um, I think we're now opening the floor to questions. I don't think I've run over time, but um, I haven't seen a red card appear, Doug, so I think that's a good thing. And um, keen to take as many questions as we've got time for. Yeah, no, we do have a few minutes and uh, a great, great presentation. Those pictures are, are awesome at the end. Um, there, there are some questions around, you mentioned the um, kind of, or, or how you view the entry into the retirement village space. You mentioned the high um, 
the high EBITDA margins associated with the acuity care? And how do you kind of see that balancing out with some of the pushes into the more retirement village um, type um, uh, homes? So over to you on that one. Yeah, look, I think uh, out of all the listed operators, we are currently by far the most skewed to care at 95%. And I think the retirement village part of the business will mean that we have, um, if you like, at more sites, a funnel of uh, younger residents that come in, enjoy everything we can offer in a village environment. Uh, you know, some of the retirement villages, and I've been to many, many around the country from all the companies, and they're frankly amazing and we want to be amazing plus um, and offer just unique service um, you know hotel type and style service to our residents um, so that they kind of look forward to those years as opposed to uh, um, you know they have to do it and you know some of the, the product being built and certainly the product being planned at Northwood is is amazing and will cater to um, a, a different um, set of society and you know the stats are fairly well known in terms of the, the bulge over the next 30 years in that um, over 70. So um, we're keen keen to provide a, a um, an opportunity for them to join the Radius family. And it looks like um, from some of the slides you showed, you have developments in, in a lot of different parts of the country. Is that a deliberate attempt at diversification or is that more where you're finding opportunities that, that make sense? Yeah, look, we're a very non-Auckland-centric portfolio. If you compare to our listed competitors, we have three uh, care homes in Auckland out of 23. So I think it's it's probably a function of where our, our care homes and sites are. And I think it is a, it's really good to have that geographical diversity. I mean, we've got two great care homes in Christchurch and The Land, which we'll be visiting next week. And, you know, amazingly, despite all the headwinds, the, the Canterbury uh, property market is still um, relatively buoyant. So, you know, we're, we're um, you know, that that's a good thing. And, um, but but we will continue to, to look to develop out our sites and optimise the portfolio where it makes sense from a development and a demand perspective. And we do have time for one more question. There, there are a few more, but I'll, we'll get those out to everyone yeah. as well. But it says, um, so your developments are relatively small, I guess, com compared to some of the other um, new things happening in New Zealand. How do you achieve economies of scale uh, with, with developments of that size? Yeah, okay. The, I, I mean, we are smaller. I think the nature of our developments is slightly different um, in terms of if you look at the developments we talked about excluding Northwood, a lot are focused on care beds and care suites which um, you know we have the existing infrastructure at all those sites so they'll be profitable and um, EBITDA uplift on on day one whether they're sold as a mix of premium charging or care suites so without getting too technical um, we can pivot pretty quickly uh, to to um, those units and, and we don't have for instance large numbers of retirement village apartments which you know in the downswing of the property might, might be a bit of a stock overhang you know our smaller um, developments in you know more or less metropolitan areas will be easier to sell down quickly uh, particularly with the care bed and care suite methodology so I hope that answers the question. Yeah that's fantastic. Um, well Andrew thank you very much and uh, like I said there are a few more questions but we'll get those out to you and, and send them out to the, the group but thanks again for taking the time to um, present and we really appreciate it. Pleasure and thank you so much for having me on and um, have a good day everyone. So, oh, and there's uh, Marianne just making sure. Hello. Um, so our next our next presenter will be Marianne Johnson. She's with the Ministry of Awesome, and I will let Marianne get into more details about what that is. But I'll give you a little background on Marianne. Uh, Ministry of Awesome is not a listed company, but it, this is one of the uh, organizations we have on that kind of promotes the ecosystem. Uh, Marianne's been leading the Ministry of Awesome since late 2017, helping to drive a dynamic startup. Uh, an innovation ecosystem that will power New Zealand uh, and, and its future success. Marion is deeply passionate about creating a successful Kiwi uh, high growth startup community and driving collaboration between founders, investors, government, uh, and, and corporates through the um, uh, their hub in Christchurch and, and other 
venues they have. So Marianne, thank you very much and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking you through a little bit about what Ministry of Awesome um, does, but essentially what we are is a force for high growth startups um, and innovators in New Zealand. And so everything we do is really about um, explaining why startups are important for anyone who doesn't understand that um, and really um, telling the story for startups um, to government, to the wider public, to talent coming up in the space. Um, and, uh, and so I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview of, of the work that we do in the space. So um, just a, a quick fact that in developed economies, up to 70% of all new job growth comes from high growth startups. Um, and that's pretty amazing when you think about um, 10 years from now, the future companies uh, that are on the stock exchange are going to be very different from the lineup that you see at the moment. And I am absolutely confident that many of the companies who are on the stock exchange will be um, companies that are currently going through our startup incubation portfolio and through our accelerators. Um, so why, again, as far as New Zealand is, co is concerned as a nation, the context, why are startups so important? Um, because we really need to alleviate our reliance on primary industry. Um, and because uh, we, have a, we have a huge amount of disruption in technology, which is changing every single sector there is, and we have to invest in, um, in the companies that are innovating in those future technologies in order to have relevance on the global stage. Um, so, as I said before, we always introduce ourselves as a force for New Zealand startups and innovators. That means we're their ally um, across the, um, the ecosystem in New Zealand. Um, so, on the right-hand side, you'll see our HQ. So, our headquarters is in a building which is called Te Ohaka, which means the nest in, um, in Te Reo. Um, so, New Zealand as an ecosystem, as a startup ecosystem, is in activation phase. Um, and that terminology actually comes from an organization which is uh, worldwide called the Startup Genome. And Startup has, Genome is essentially the only organization in the world that has collected data from all of the different um, cities in the world who have a startup um, ecosystem and has sort of ranked the values of the ecosystems, the numbers of players in the ecosystems, the success of those ecosystems. And we're right at the very beginning of, of, our, of our, our stage of growth. Um, so they call that the activation phase. And so the jobs that need to be done um, to make sure that our ecosystem grows and gets onto the next stage um, are number one, we have to role model, we have to do a ton of storytelling. Essentially our job here is to make startups a thing. Um, and then the second thing that we do at Ministry of Awesome and the second, the second objective in the activation phase is that once we have talent um, coming through to the top of our pipeline, we comb through it, we find the, the, the high capable talent, and we build their capability, connectivity, and all their investment pipelines. Um, and then the third strategy, the third piece of what we do in this activation phase is we make sure that we bring larger organizations in New Zealand and corporates in New Zealand on board um, alongside those startup founders, alongside the investors, alongside the academics and the innovators and the deep tech people and the general community um, in order to build that entrepreneurial density. And basically what that means is shoving all of these brilliant people together in a very small space, making sure that they ping off each other, make the connections they need to connect. Um, and that in itself engineers serendipity. So we're basically reducing luck. We're trying to create our own luck. Uh, by bringing all of those key players together. So our focus at Ministry of Awesome is the top of the startup pipeline. So that means right at the very beginning, people are sitting there thinking, I have this fantastic um, innovative idea. It's a solution for a major global problem. Um, I'm going to start uh, developing it. And once that, once that founder has developed some market validation, some customer validation, potentially they have a first customer um, potentially their, their pre-revenue, they might be pre-minimum viable product. At that stage, they come see Ministry of Awesome and we pull them into the pipeline from there. Um, so job one, job number one around that whole making startups a thing, um, if I could give a, a real example that is that has only just occurred, I don't know if any of you are on LinkedIn or saw this blowing up on Twitter um, 
a week and a half ago, we just had a, a women founders conference. And so what that meant is we had um, about 400 high growth startup founders who are women um, at the Electrify Aotearoa conference. And essentially um, what we were doing there is we were doing a role modeling piece where we had founders like um, Sonia from Sharesies, Olive Sampson from Kami, um, basically household names in the startup ecosystem here in New Zealand. Um, we had them presenting to uh, women and talking about their, their journey, their startup journey, journey to show that it can be done. Um, and essentially Electrify Aotearoa was like a thunderclap for the women founders ecosystem. And the reason that we were focusing specifically in this instance on women is because worldwide, 83% of all venture capital investment goes to all male startup teams and only 2% goes to all women startup teams. And since startups are responsible for 70% of our future job growth, it just means that um, 70% of our future job growth is being created by male run companies. Um, so obviously we need to bring some more women into the startup pipeline. So in this instance, we were role modeling to women founders, but we do events just like this for all founders um, in the startup ecosystem. Job number two, um, which is around that identifying the talent, building capability, connecting and investment pipelines. Um, once we bring people into the startup pipeline, we will bring them into, for example, our incubator. Um, so we have a startup incubator called Founder Catalyst. It runs out of Te Ohaka um, on the ground floor of that building there. Um, and there we have 30 high growth startup founders working on their innovation. Um, and every nine months we take on more cohorts. Um, and so what that means is they might come in at a uh, minimal viable product. Um, so they're at the very beginning stages of having created a product, perhaps they're testing it in a market, perhaps they have a first pilot customer and we'll bring them in, we'll incubate their businesses, we will connect them to future customers, um, we will give them capabilities that they might need to succeed. So for example, they might need um, they might need some training as far as marketing or digital media storytelling or um, you know, looking at um, uh, raising capital, um, whatever they need, wherever the, wherever the capabilities are not that strong, we will train them up so that they can progress with their company. And essentially our goal is to get them to product market fit and to get them to their first investment, which would probably be a pre-seed round. Job number three around that building entrepreneurial density and basically trying to remove luck and engineering our own luck by bringing all the key players together. Some really good examples of how we've done that recently um, is we teamed up with one of our electricity distributors, Orion Energy Accelerator, um, to do an accelerator which was focused on future focused energy. And that means energy that is more sustainable, um, energy that is using some of the disruptive technology that is just starting to come through. Um, and we did that alongside Ara'ake, which is New Zealand's national future energy um, hub. Um, and we had 10 teams coming through the accelerator. The accelerator was only nine, uh, nine weeks long. And over those, those nine weeks, they developed their product further. They worked alongside Orion to, um, to validate their, their product. Um, and to also ensure that they had market validation from potential customers. Um, they went to Taranaki and met with some energy leadership um, and also with uh, some regional government. Um, and as a result of the accelerator, four out of 10 of the startups that went through are now rapidly commercializing and have raised investment in that pre-seed or seed round for their ventures. Um, and as some, an example of what their ventures might be, um, one of them is a new technology in EV charging, which is being picked up by one of our um, you know, most well-known um, energy uh, companies in New Zealand. Um, and another one was looking at how to convert solar on farm um, and, um, and other sort of ventures like that. So really exciting technology that is being commercialized that's coming straight out of uh, New Zealand um, and that is being accelerated quickly through the assistance of a larger organization like Orion, who can bring their expertise, um, who can bring their capital, um, and by a, a national leading organization like Ara'ake. Another example of uh, number three, which is that engineering serendipity, so bringing a larger organization 
um, teaming them up with the startup community to try to um, circumvent the issue that most startups have. So startups will usually come up with a solution to a problem and then they go try and find customers. Um, but we have large industry players who have problems. If we get the large industry player together with a problem, ask them to put the problem to the startups, we end up actually sort of bridging that gap um, and, and, and both sides win. So an example of how we did that last year was teaming up with Ryman Healthcare. Uh, we created something called the Health Tech Supernode Challenge, uh, where we asked 10 high growth startup teams to solve three of the problems that Ryman was putting forward around, um, around uh, the elder care uh, sector as a whole. Um, and out of that challenge, two of the 10 uh, organizations that have come through are now in their seed round um, and really interesting technology that is world first coming out again, coming out from New Zealand. So since May 2019, these are numbers that are specifically for uh, the Founder Catalyst Program at Teohaka. Since May 2019, we've worked with 87 startups going through the incubator program. And um, the startups have raised 18 million. And this may not sound like a, a ton, but when you're talking about companies that are pre-revenue, that are pre-market fit, um, and we're talking about rounds that could be as small as $100,000, 18 million is, um, is a pretty darn good um, um, number to hit. Um, and the startups have uh, created 168 full-time uh, new jobs. So here's an example of what the ecosystem looks like across uh, the country. This is actually a chart from two years ago. So at the time there was 400 plus high growth startups creating 10,000 plus high value jobs. As you can see on the far right end of it, you're talking about unicorns like Xero, Rocket Lab, Lanzatech, um, and also we now have uh, Sequent. There's a few here that have actually sold. Um, so this is the high growth startups ecosystem um, from two years ago, and this is so much more populated now. Um, the New Zealand government is um, is 100% uh, behind really focusing on high growth startups and and um, putting their sort of resourcing and budgeting behind it um, because they also understand that startup founders are our ambitious problem solvers for the future. They create jobs. They thrive when um, in uncertain times. Um, they have a huge contribution to major government imperatives like um, the productivity issues that we have. But even more importantly, climate change, uh, well-being, the ITPs, um, and essentially innovative um, innovation as a whole. And then, of course, our startup founders are going to be responsible for driving our economic global relevance and driving our leadership on the world stage. And that's obviously very important for New Zealand. Um, so finally, I guess I, I just want to finish that um, at Electrify Aotearoa um, on the 26th, which is now almost two weeks ago, um, Minister Woods came along and did one of the keynote speeches and she announced um, a, a brand new initiative from the government, which is the Startup Council. Um, and the Startup Council is going to be headed up by uh, Minister Nash, um, uh, sharing with Minister Woods. Um, essentially, the Startup Council is, I believe it's six people um, from the startup and innovation ecosystem, all of whom are going to be advising into government um, as to what potential um, levers can be pushed by government, what strategies, what policies um, could help us grow the startup and innovation ecosystem dramatically, because our goals are extremely high. Um, by 2030, we're looking to create 10,000 active high growth startups. Now, these are just the goals that we've set ourselves, um, um, but we are hell bent on on achieving them. Um, we're looking at achieving 500,000 future focused jobs. Uh, we're looking at a GDP uplift of 10 billion. Um, obviously, with high value jobs in technology, you're also looking at a massive productivity uplift. Um, we're looking at a carbon neutral economy driving equity and diversity across the entire um, tech and innovation sector. Um, and we really want to make sure that New Zealand is a country where high growth entrepreneurship becomes part of the Kiwi DNA. And I guess this is something that actually I should have started with um, at the very beginning of, of this discussion was that when we talk about startup, I keep saying high growth startup. And what I mean by that is a startup is not a company that's small. 
or a, a, a company that's just at the beginning. It may be small, it may be just at the beginning, but it has zero intention of remaining that way. So a high growth startup is a company that is looking for global scale from day one. Um, so that means that whatever it is, it's an innovation that can be scaled around the world. And they're looking at uh, taking their product or their service and exporting it across um, the globe from the moment they've actually um, um, started. Um, so that's it for my presentation. And I'm looking forward to having any questions that you might have for me. Thanks, Mary. That was, was awesome. And um, we do have a few questions, mainly around what you're seeing in terms of, um, you mentioned the, the solar, uh, some of the solar technologies and EV charging. What else are you seeing that's very innovative, innovative or that Kiwi founders are doing especially well uh, in terms of verticals, industries, and types of technologies? Well, um, I mean, this won't be a surprise to you at all. We do really well at SaaS, um, software as a service. Um, and software as a service, a perfect example might be Xero. Um, Xero is something that is not unusual for us in terms of being able to create a digital platform um, that is sold on a um, on a on a monthly or an annual basis, and it's a service that can be um, tapped in from anywhere anywhere in the world. Um, and you know, I was speaking to an investor, a startup investor, not too long ago, who said that they thought that maybe why New Zealand um, startup founders are so good at software as a service um, is that we are. Our largest companies are in other markets, a medium sized, a small to medium sized company. Um, and so that when we are making these, um, these platforms, we're making them for SMEs in mind, um, at least SMEs in other markets. And so they, they, they're really engaging, they really resonate and, and, um, and they solve problems for exactly that category of, of business. So SaaS is definitely an area of huge growth for us. Um, but we're also really strong um, and we're becoming even stronger in, believe it or not, aerospace. So mm -hmm. aerospace is, is actually an incredible growth industry for us. I mean, obviously you all will, uh, will know about Rocket Lab, um, but there's also Dawn Aerospace, which is based here in Canterbury. And there's another um, really exciting new startup coming up called uh, Kia Aerospace. Um, and, you know, when... When the Canterbury earthquake happened, I was here about a year before that, um, and and then the earthquake happened, and then the city really reimagined itself. And I remember talking to the economic development agency called Christchurch NZ, and they said to me one of the key focuses as a sector for what the city was going to focus on was aerospace. And I at the time I thought they were mad. I had no idea why would they be focusing on aerospace. It didn't seem to make sense for Canterbury, which was you know largely primary industry. Um, and it turns out that we have a quick shot straight into polar orbit just by dint of the fact of where we are located on the globe. Um, we have uh, so little um, airspace traffic, um, so we can actually um, launch on a regular basis. Um, and we just have that Kiwi ingenuity, ingenuity which is, um, I, I know it's a little bit of a cheat to say that, but we we really do um, work through things uh, piece by piece and making sure that, that we can succeed in our innovation. Our capability of innovation is really aided by um, the strength of our engineering schools, particularly University of Canterbury, um, by our CRIs who are constantly contributing um, strong innovation output that can then be commercialized. Um, so I would say aerospace, that would be a second sector um, that we're really strong in. Um, and then finally, um, around agri and agri-tech, um, I mean, Israel is probably one of the, the, the strongest countries in the world on agri-tech, but we are doing really well as far as dairy sort of related um, agri is concerned. So um, innovations like Halter, I'm sure you've heard of Halter, and, um, and they're definitely one to watch, which is essentially... I didn't know that you could do this, but you can train cows and Halter has come up with a technology that trains cows so that um, mass movements and behavior is something that, that can be dealt to. Um, and then all the agri-tech around um, nitrates and managing nitrates, um, that's something that um, being a country that is struggling with the impact on, um, on our environment as um, dairy has had, um, we're seeing a lot of innovation coming through in that sector as well. Thanks. So there are more questions. There's one more. I'm, I'm gonna. There's one more topic that is getting asked a bit here. 
do you guys provide funding? And, and regardless, if not, what is the funding environment that you see? We've heard about gaps in the um, in the private not private equity but venture, especially startup, or the growth kind of money coming in. Is there enough um, private equity or venture capital money out there to, to support these companies? Yeah. So I'll answer the first question um, first, which was, no, we do not provide funding. And this is actually something that I'm that I'm really proud of. This is a point of difference for Ministry of Awesome. So we work in the startup and innovation ecosystem, and we are 100% founder focused. So we're a not for profit. Um, we do the three things, those three strategies that I talked to you guys through. We do it 100%. Um, on behalf of founders. We don't take investment in your company. We don't give you advice based on ownership. We don't, we don't do that at all. We are 100% just in your corner and we will help you succeed. We will help you scale. We'll give you the assistance you need. We'll introduce you to investors. We understand how important um, investment is uh, for a high growth startup because they have to grow fast. In order to grow fast, you, you will generally not be bootstrapping, which means you know obviously growing with your revenue, um, you will generally be looking at investment um, in order to um, sort of power that growth. Uh, in terms of what does the investment space look like for high growth startups in the very beginning, you're usually raising with family and friends. Um, you might be raising with a high net worth individual. You might then go to an angel group. Um, there's a very, very active angel investment ecosystem here in New Zealand. Um, chaired by the amazing um, Suze Reynolds from the Angel Association New Zealand. Um, you can find angel investor groups all across the country. Some are very, very active, some are not that active, some have funds, um, some pass the hat round. Um, and generally that's for your pre-seed round. So that's anything, you know, let's just say from 50K through to um, maybe even a million. And even angels will take part in, um, in larger rounds as well. Um, and then after that, you're probably going to VCs, so venture capital or um, or uh, private capital. Um, and when you're at that stage, then you're probably at a seed round, so you're raising maybe one, one and a half to uh, you know three million. Uh, and then after that, you're at venture capital again, but now you're probably looking more overseas as well because you want those those investors to also be able to help you grow your product overseas so that's what the ecosystem looks like in terms of the current environment um it's changing dramatically um right now i mean obviously the markets everywhere are um just very full of action um is probably the best way to put it um for those for those vcs who have funds that have already been raised they need to spend them um, maybe they'll be more careful, um, but they do have funds that need to be spent. Um, New Zealand Growth Capital Partners, uh, which is the um, government um, fund of funds that has contributed to a lot of the venture capital funds here in New Zealand, um, is still very active. Um, if you'd asked me about five months ago, I would have said to you, if you are a high growth founder with strong capability and a really good value proposition, and you've got your good numbers and you've got a proof of, you know, proof of product market fit, I can find you funding, no problem. Um, because there was so much funding around. There's still a lot of funding around, but because of all the noise from overseas, people are starting to get a little, little worried um, mm -hmm. because they're just wondering how long are they gonna have to hunker down for? So they have the dollars, but they're just thinking, shoot, am I gonna have to save this? Um, yeah. and, and, and that's having a knock-on effect. Yeah, interesting, really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to hear what's going on kind of in the startup world and the private um, company world. And hopefully those companies will end up listing someday. A lot of them will, but um, thanks again for the time. And we will call okay. it, um, yeah, we will call it a, a, a session there. There are some more questions for Marion and we'll get those to her and out to everyone uh, as well. So thanks again for everyone for attending and thanks to our presenters and uh, we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, Doug.